Welcome to Holding Down the Fort, a podcast show dedicated to curating knowledge, resources, and relevant stories so military spouses can continue to make confident and informed decisions for their families. Because, let's face it, we know who's really holding down the fort. I'm Jen Amos, a Gold Star daughter, a veteran spouse, and your host for today's show. Let's get started. Hey everyone, welcome back. I'm excited to get into our first interview for 2020. But before I do, let's talk about money. Holding Down the Fort is brought to you by US Vet Wealth. And here at US Vet Wealth, we're all about financial education for military families. This year, we're all about creating more education around your survivor benefit plan. Here's an excerpt from our article, How to Avoid the Pitfalls of SBP and VGLI at Military Retirement, from our company website, usvetwealth.com. How to avoid the pitfalls of SBP and VGLI at military retirement. The last 12 to 18 months before military retirement is characterized by a fire hose of retirement briefings. For most, this is a time of information overload, uncertainty, and possibly fear. And it is during this time that Uncle Sam requires a retiree to make a financial decision that can impact a military family for generations. The decision is whether or not to accept the Survivor Benefit Plan, also known as SBP for short, and Veterans Group Life Insurance, VGLI for short. Created in 1972, the Survivor Benefit Plan is a form of life insurance that operates as an annuity. Instead of paying out a lump sum to the beneficiary like most life insurance policies, it pays out a portion, about 55% of the member's retirement pay each month until the survivor either passes away or is no longer eligible to receive the payments. It was designed to provide a basic level of support in the event a retired veteran predeceases their spouse. The SBP costs the same for everyone, 6.5% of their pension deducted automatically from their pension check and is payable only upon the death of the insured veteran. VGLI is administered by the Veterans Administration. It is presented to the veteran as a replacement for Survivor Members Group Life Insurance, also known as SGLI, which is the government-sponsored life insurance provided during active duty service. VGLI is presented as a benefit because there's no qualification required if coverage is accepted within 240 days of service. This is a good option for the service member with a life-threatening disability who is thus unable to qualify for privatized life insurance. But many of our veterans without life-threatening disabilities who are paying into this program are not fully aware of the severe structured cost increase that occur as they get older. The price of VGLI goes up every five years and it's a fixed cost for everybody. It's easy to calculate exactly how much someone will be paying into this by referring to the cost table provided by the government. If you want to take a look at the cost table provided by the government, please check out our show notes and the link will be provided for you to visit that website. So here's the thing, service members and their families are poorly educated about SBP, SGLI, and VGLI. Retirees and their spouses are often shocked to discover the costs involved in both survivor benefit protection and replacing SGLI with VGLI. Spouses are often shocked to learn how little they'll receive in survivorship payments if the worst actually does occur. SBP, SGLI, and VGLI are all presented as benefits, even though the service member and veteran are paying for them. Government insurance packages are still insurance, and these policies are managed by a for-profit company by people who don't work for free. The only aspect of these plans that are given to the service member or veteran is the guarantee of coverage without qualification. Many retirees and their spouses think that SBP is the only option available to give the surviving spouse some financial protection if the retiree dies. Little to no guidance is offered regarding alternative, privatized options on the free market. Because it's presented as part of the government retirement program, many retirees who are well used to following orders without question feel compelled to enroll in SBP and VGLI, committing themselves to the program for the rest of their lives. In fact, 80% of career service members do this. This means millions of dollars of taxpayer-funded benefits are being redirected right back to the government each year to fund existing SBP payments or to pay a third-party contracted insurer, such as Prudential. 
Similar to Social Security, the continuity of the program depends upon each succeeding generation paying into it. So the government does its best to entice its employees to enroll rather than encouraging military families to ensure that they are doing what is in their best interest. Of course, there are plenty of circumstances in which the SBP or VGLI combo are in a military family's best interest. But if the status quo path leading from military service to nine to five grind to retirement doesn't inspire you, then hey, we're glad that you found this episode and are listening to this blog entry from our website, usvetwealth.com. Because here at usvetwealth.com, we've got a better option for you. All right, and that's a little snippet of the article, How to Avoid the Pitfalls of SPP and VGLI at Military Retirement from our website, usvetwealth.com. You can read more by visiting our website or check out our show notes at holdingdownthefortpodcast.com. Thanks for taking the time to learn more about your benefits. Now let's get into the interview. All right. Hi, everyone. Jen Amos here with Holding Down the Fort podcast show. And as always, every time I get to do another show, it means that I get to interview another incredible person in our military community. So I'd like to introduce you all to Nikki Zellner. Nikki owns a unique content consultancy called Where Content Connects, where she works with women leaders to create impactful content for their brand or business. In reality, she helps badass lady bosses share their authentic stories to form stronger relationships with their audience. Her core values are connection, creativity, honesty, authenticity, learning, and openness. And these drive everything she does, every decision she makes, and it's what she has built her business around. Other fun facts about Nikki, she's part of the Millspo Project Leadership Team, providing live events to military spouse entrepreneurs. She's also an artist and a writer. And of course, we can't forget, she's a Navy wife and mother of two boys under five years old. Nikki, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Jen. Yes, it's my absolute pleasure. I was just saying offline how I realized I didn't respond to your email months ago. (laughs) And I just think it's a great opportunity to really wrap up the year and to really actually kick off the new year with you uh, sharing your story and speaking to our audience here of military spouses. So thanks for joining us today. Again, thanks for having me. I'm super excited to be on. Yeah. So why don't we start with you sharing, uh, how did you hear about the podcast show, Holding Down to Four? And more importantly, what inspired you to join us on our show today? So I'm pretty sure the first time that I heard about your podcast was, I believe, before it was even released. (laughs) Yeah, Um, One of your previous guests, Jamie Chapman, uh, happened to be one of my content coaching clients. And I had been working with Jamie about her LinkedIn presence and how to be more Jamie on the platform, how to bring her own sass and her own unique perspective to interviews that she would do, podcast interviews, television interviews, as well as her organic content that she was putting out into the world. So the first time I heard about Jamie was actually when she was preparing to be on your show. And then Jamie kind of referred me to you and said, hey, I think Nikki would be a good guest at some point. I wrote you a sweet little note. And then we met in person at the Military Influencer Conference when I attended Scott's LinkedIn class, which I loved because I always like listening to guys teach. I always find it fascinating, the difference between how men and women deliver content and Mm. how they each bring their own personalities. And Scott showed up in flip flops and jeans and a plaid shirt. And I was like, That's Scott, right? Like he's exactly like he was on LinkedIn. He wasn't a different person. And then to actually finally get to meet you, I did not know that you were Scott's wife when Jamie introduced us. (laughs) I just knew that like all of a sudden the connection was fused and I was just like, oh my gosh, like it's the dynamic duo, like the two of them together. That's adorable. So (laughs) thanks, Nikki. (laughs) It's great to see kind of husband and wife teams in action. But it's really great to see an authentic couple, right? Even though some things that you guys do are polished and obviously planned and strategized about, you guys are very unique and authentic when you come to the table and when you have conversations. So I really appreciated that. Oh, thanks, Nikki. I appreciate 
everything that you just said. And it was an absolute pleasure uh, finally to meet you in person at Military Influencer Conference, as well as Jamie as well. I was actually shocked that she was there because I know she lives in Germany. And when I met her in person, I was like, oh, I was like, you're here, you know? <laughs> and she's like, she's like, yeah. Like she like she said, yeah, as if like, duh, of course I'm here, you know? And uh, I know she also accepted an award over there at Military uh, Influencer Conference as well. Yeah. So uh, number one, you, mill Jamie. spouse owned business. Yes. I mean, it's, you know, it was uh, crowd participation and crowdsource voting and she's a beast, man. So all the props yeah. to Jamie. I was, I'm super flattered to, to kind of be on her team in that capacity. So super excited for her and what this year holds for her. Yeah, she's incredible uh, for sure. And I love following her story and following her on on LinkedIn, <laughs> really in, her, <laughs> in her, uh, her progress, like in growing her business and everything. Yeah. And thank you for just what you said about uh, Scott and I. I think the reason why we are authentic is because Scott, like, so for me, I'm, I could be very methodical. Like I like to plan things in advance and I like to have like, like a game plan when I go into things like military influencer conference, but Scott's kind of like the, so what are we doing right now? You know, it's <laughs> <laughs> so what makes you a good team. I'm, I'm married to an engineer and uh, okay. an introverted engineer, you know, anti, I don't want to say antisocial, but just not, social butterfly, you know, uh, I could talk to a wall and be okay. But him, it's like, you know, what are we going to talk about? You know, all of those kinds of things. So I I understand having a balance of a relationship. And I think you guys balance each other very well. Oh, man, I'd I'd like to believe so. (laughs) So (laughs) I'd like to believe so. But yeah, no, it's funny, because it's getting a lot colder here in Virginia. And uh, Mm -hmm. we'll go to the beach and he's still wearing flip flops. And I'm already wearing my snow boots because it's that cold. (laughs) If there's anyone that's authentic in this relationship, I feel like it's him because he just lives in the present all the time. And I feel like I always have to prepare for things, right? And so anyway, (laughs) that's us. And uh, but he he does bring a lot of adventure into my life. So shout out to Scott, my husband, (laughs) Scott Tucker, (laughs) for adding adventure in my life. Because yeah, I mean, I wouldn't know what it'd be like to date someone or to be with someone exactly like me. I think it'd be quite boring. I think I would find it excruciating (laughs) if I dated myself. Uh, I feel like I give the appropriate amount of self care. But if I had to date myself, I would be in pain. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. So opposites really do attract. That's the lesson of this conversation. (laughs) Well, Nikki, awesome. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. For people that are learning about you for the first time, why don't you share a snapshot of your life today? Particularly, what keeps you excited and busy about life nowadays? So I want to preface by saying the military spouse life for me came after a full career. So did Mm. parenthood. I had 16, 17 years of career, non-military life. I was not married to my husband, Peter, at the time. I had my first child at 36. I am now 40, so you can do some math there. But I want to say that my life today, I had done the climbing the ladder thing already. Mm. I had done the in pursuit of the title thing already. Mm -hmm. And my husband has never done that. He's only ever been in the military he is transitioning out next year. And mm. so he's just now, we've totally flip-flopped our lives, right? He's a younger parent who's going to be entering the job market at a very different time than how wow. I experienced the job market. Mm-hmm. So for me, I feel like there comes a point, I don't want to just say in women's life, but there comes a point in everybody's life where you stop striving to be something for somebody else. And you really start to come back to this sense of purpose and this sense of fire that's within yourself. And you start to care about the BS less. You start Mm. to say, I don't need to be at every networking event. That doesn't do anything for me. (laughs) Right. Uh, So I actually had a few things that really changed my perspective on what I considered to be the direction of my life. And so the first turning point was obviously entering that military spouse world, entering Mm -hmm. military life. I had never had anybody in my family, at least in the immediate family, who had served. My grandfather had served. My grandmother, I think, was in the nurse corps. But like for all intents and purposes, I was not familiar with military life in the slightest. And so Mm -hmm. when I entered military life, even though we've never PCS, we've always been in Norfolk, Virginia Beach area. He has prior to me. But since we've been together, we've never left this market. And so 
it was very interesting to kind of see the different sects and niche groups within the military community. All of a sudden, there was differences in military affiliation. There was differences in spouse groups. And it was really about like, what are you into? And so Mm -hmm. I, I found myself very thankful that I already had ownership of who I was and could really gravitate towards the things that excited me most. Overlay on top of that, I had two children back to back. I call them my deployment rainbow babies. I was not (laughs) successful having children prior to that, but I have two beautiful boys. One is four and a half and one it turns three in a couple of weeks. He was a Christmas baby. So um, very nice. yes, uh, I like to say we're in the phase of life now where everything is treated as a potty because they're potty training and (laughs) the whole place, they, they just run wild, basically. So we're in that lovely phase of motherhood and parenthood where they can talk, they can feed themselves, but they still need attention day in and day out and guidance, rules, structure, all of those kinds of things. So that's the second turning point was becoming a mother and kind of realizing it's not about me all the time. Mm. And the third thing was getting diagnosed with a chronic illness. I got diagnosed with fibromyalgia the same year my mother passed away. I had been having pain since my C-section with my youngest son. And it was really starting to affect work. It was starting to affect the quality of my work and the ability for me to work in traditional fashion in which I had had a career. Mm -hmm. So I had to step away from cube life, as I call it, hashtag cube life. And I had (laughs) to really, (laughs) I had to really embrace remote work. I really had to embrace project-based kind of work. And as I started to do that, I really started to push the boundaries and explore more deeply If I can only do something for so many hours of day, wouldn't I rather that be something that I loved than something I hated? Mm. Right. (laughs) So that's kind of where we are now is, again, pushing those boundaries and really being open and vulnerable about how I got here and open and vulnerable with audiences, you know, clients, family members who don't understand what a military life be being 40 with two kids running around your ankles and three (laughs) trying to Mm -hmm. run your own business and be a content creator and a writer and an artist, you know, just really like letting that come out of you so that you can live your best life. So that's where we are today. Wow. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. There's some key things that you said that really stood out to me. The first thing is that you're just so over climbing the ladder. You're over, (laughs) you know, you're over taking BS or like putting up with BS. Like you're just over all of that. And I think that most of us spend our lives trying to impress people that don't even care about us. Right. And it's just awesome that you've come to this place, you know, with becoming a mother and with your illness and, and, and just your circumstances where you're like, you know what, like, if I'm going to do anything, I need to enjoy it. I need to enjoy it. I need to love it. And so it's just, I feel like I was going to say this earlier, but one thing I like about your online presence, how you put yourself out there is it's like clear to the point, but you also give off the sense of compassion that I'm sure you give to your clients. And I just feel all of that from you. And it makes a lot of sense given your life and where you're at today. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, very beautiful stuff. So, well, thank you for sharing that. Let's go ahead and talk about our educational topic today, because the purpose of holding down the four is to provide education and resources to military spouses and families that they otherwise wouldn't get, or maybe they just kind of like ignore it or just kind of don't look at it because it's not recommended to them. I tend to find that we tend to take people that we know, like, and trust, we tend to take their recommendation over like, you know, someone we don't know, right? And so that's really what the show is about is bring people such as yourself that's human and real and you're in the community and you're active in the community um, and providing value to the community. And so today we wanted to talk about how to find and share your voice to create meaningful opportunities and greater impact. I'd love for you to elaborate on that more, Nikki, and and what that means to you and, and how you're doing that today. Sure. I think that one of the things that really interested me about the whole idea of finding your voice. I worked in marketing for a lot of years. 
I had my first marketing job in 1998. I was in advertising in a small town newspaper and that started as a newspaper career and, you know, culminated kind of in the Baltimore Sun market and major newspaper market in the United States. And it also took me through kind of designing 15 lifestyle magazines throughout the Southeast United States. So I designed and launched those and really got to hear different stories of how businesses started how people in the community play a much stronger role. And what I found kind of in that magazine development world was the stories that we thought people would want to read about. It was the stories where people were most vulnerable were the ones that continually got the buzz. It was the ones where people shared not what their business does and what it's all about. They shared how that business got there and why it's the lifeblood of what they do and why they can't sleep at night, you know, when they think about their business and who they want to serve. And so when I started thinking about how I could move from the parts of marketing and advertising that I didn't like, which was the staged, more set up feeling of this Mm -hmm. is our brand, this is the direction it's going, this is our ABCDE strategy, was that it took the humans out of it. So I really Mm. gravitate towards brands that, you know, I'm an exennial. I came from traditional news and marketing, but I've really embraced brands that have shown that they can be adaptable to social, email, podcasts, those kinds of things where they're taking the different formats and sharing more of themselves and being less scripted and being less... Mm -hmm here's 10 different people that touched this before you saw it. So I really Mm. can appreciate when somebody is open to saying, I don't want 10 people to touch my brand before the customer knows me. That's really important to me. So my business and the stories that I help people share is built around really the six C's of content of sharing your voice, sharing your story. So, so many people say, I want a marketing strategy. Well, you have to start with the message first. (laughs) And before you can start with the message, it's who is giving that message? Who is delivering that message? So if it's an overall brand where you have no desire to put a human on that brand, I don't want to help you. You are not for me. You can go find an agency that can rock and roll that for you. I am just so in love with the female entrepreneur who says... I want to have the relationship with my people. I want the people to know me and I want the people to know how I got here and my stories and what I struggle with. And I want them to buy from me or refer people to me because of who I am, not because of how I sold them. So I think that that's really important to me. So in finding your voice, I call it the six C's. I really focus on telling people to think about their characters. And characters would be the role that they play in their stories and Mm. the character of themselves. What are their values? What do they believe in? How do they exhibit their behaviors on a consistent basis? As well as the character kind of of their customers. Who are their customers? Talking about Mm -hmm. them in their stories, who they help. So not from the sense of I help 20 somethings, you know, get financially fit more so I want to work with the person who is really going to make a huge impact in the world. They want to do this through digital means and they need a financial advisor that can help them do X who is going to be with them for the long term. Right. So that's a much Mm -hmm. more specific conversation than just I help this avatar. Right. (laughs) Mm -hmm, Right. So characters are very important. And I think the values of those characters have to be brought to the surface. So before anybody goes and invests marketing dollars, I always tell people like, who are your characters and what is your own character? Because for somebody who says they love peace, love and understanding, and somebody looks at your Facebook page and you're complaining five posts out of six, (laughs) that's not, you know, like a good many of your clients are going to come from your personal network and they Mm. can see the real you. They Mm -hmm. can see the transformation that you've had throughout your life. You know, they can see how you went from peppy cheerleader in a high school that was mean to people, possibly. I was a cheerleader. I'm not going to knock them. 
who is mean to people to all of a sudden saying, you know, you want to be people's life coach. Well, bullying Mm. isn't really a great trait to have. So I want people to know that the character matters, the character of their clients and the character of themselves and, and how do those characters relate to the story. So character is number one. And, and number two is connection. A lot of people put stuff out there and I call it set it and forget it, right? They put something mm-hmm. out into the world. They put their story out into the world and they just expect people to respond to it. They mm-hmm. have no intention of engaging in other people's stories. They have no intention of engaging in places and sharing it in places where it would make more of an impact for folks. So connection is really important. I am not one of those people that has 500 friends. I can count Mm -hmm. on two hands, my close friends. Mm -hmm. And those close friends get 95% of my energy. And everybody outside of those two hands get the other 5%. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Uh, So, you know, connection is really, really important. Some people are really great at spreading that love. They have all of the time in the world. They make a really concerted effort to make sure People feel welcome and connected, but some people have to be really strategic about where they place their energy and how they spend that energy. Mm -hmm. And I think with the advent of social and platforms like LinkedIn, which happens to be my favorite platform, what's the value there outside of booking a consultation call, right? Right, (laughs) What value are they providing as well as what value are they receiving. And so I always tell people, share your story where you get the most value. And if, you know, looking through Facebook, all you're seeing in your feeds is people who want to sell you the latest, greatest food program to make you drop 20 pounds, like you're not getting value there. Right. Um, You take advantage of those hide from feeds. (laughs) It's the best thing you can possibly do. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) You know, I was just thinking, and I feel like this is an old saying that just continues to be true, no matter what. But it's a saying that goes, facts tell, but stories sell. Yeah. And uh, I mean, you think of why Disney is so monstrous and successful is because it's all about storytelling. And if we can learn from the best storytellers, we can see that, especially if you're a small business or you're a solopreneur, it's all about telling your story. And I think, and and you can let me know that the internet is so noisy. It's almost like you're in this crowded room and you're with a lot of people, but you feel alone anyway. But then when you when you connect with that one person that says like, hey, I'm alone too. I, I'm lonely here in this crowd of people. You can build that connection. And I, I think that's what you're saying is like, you know, if, if people can just be upfront about their story and be their most authentic selves, there's going to be at least one person that's going to feel like less alone or more connected with you and will actually follow you and listen to you. <laughs> right. And a lot of people follow you without you knowing that they do. So I was really vulnerable recently on Facebook, on my personal Facebook page. I was talking about, I wanted to give some real insight as to why I was starting my podcast in 2020. And I wanted to talk to people about why I was doing it and how alone I felt as somebody living with chronic illness trying to do the work that I do and what that actually looked like on a day-to-day basis. And I had a girl from high school message me who she used the following words. Uh, She's also a military spouse. She has multiple children. And I believe that she has stayed at home to take care of these children. And and what Mm -hmm. she said to me was, I've always watched the things that you've done and been so jealous of what you've been able to do with your life. Wow. And I did not know that this person followed the things that I did. I did not realize that that was the emotion that she could get from looking at things in my feed. I see my life as something that I struggle to really make sure I'm doing something on purpose, that the things that I commit to are intentionally committed to and not for a different motive. And it kind of broke my heart a little bit that she was jealous of that, you know, Mm -hmm. and it made me think that maybe I hadn't been as vulnerable as I thought I had been about the struggles of what it was like to do those things that we, you know, you hear this on social all the time, like you only see the good things on social. And so even as open and honest and vulnerable as I think I am, it took getting on video and basically crying on a Facebook live to be like, (laughs) wow, 
my body hurts today. And let me mm. tell you why the book I told you about isn't coming out until 2020 now. <laughs> you know, mm. like I got really, really honest about like all of these things that I had been kind of highlighting. I had a major surgery and that surgery really just took me out. Mm. So a lot of the things that I had planned and scheduled and got ex- got people excited about just didn't happen. And there was like this moment of truth that kind of came out and I got more, I don't even know, like I just needed to tell somebody I needed them to understand because they were my audience that I trust. Right. I live six States away from people who I've known for, you know, for decades at this point, my closest friends don't live anywhere near me. The community Mm -hmm. I have here is the community I have built and that has welcomed me from the military space and from my own neighborhood with my kids but you never know who needs to hear your story and who needs to hear yeah. the fact that you struggle and who wants to celebrate with you when you get a win, because that's a win for them. Yeah. And so I think it's really important, like as you're building connection and talking about character, that everything that you're putting out there should be you, because if it's not, then you're doing a disservice. I love everything, everything that you said. On another podcast show that I run, we talk a lot about just being your most authentic self and just just coming on the show and just sharing your story. And I mentioned on there that the reason why it's so important to be transparent, like even if you're going through a hard time, is if you don't share that, if you just share like the highlight reel of your life you're actually doing people a disservice. You're robbing them of the opportunity to learn with you, you know, because otherwise people are thinking like, oh my gosh, I have to keep my life like, you know, just I have to keep the hard stuff like a secret, you know, I have to keep all these skeletons in a closet. But when you pull them out and people are like, oh, you have that skeleton too? (laughs) You know, (laughs) there's something about it where I haven't pinpointed it yet, but I agree with you that being authentic and vulnerable there's something about it that makes people, I don't know, just feel more connected, feel less alone or feel like they can trust you. And I actually feel like too, at least with social media, maybe this is just my feed because I've cleaned up my feed a lot in the recent years, but there's a lot of mental health accounts out there now that really educate you on like, you know, just remember when people post stuff out there, that's just a highlight reel of their life, but it's not like you're seeing them 24 hours a day, you know, like that's just one snapshot like of their day. But also even like when people do share like the vulnerable, like real stories, like I find for myself, I've learned in podcasting for me, the reason why I started podcasting is because earlier this year, um, I was diagnosed with mild depression. I didn't realize I had it. I had it for a very long time. I just I just found out for the first time. And then also, I was struggling with loneliness because like just like you, I'm far away f- from my family and friends. All my friends are in the West Coast and I'm here well, in the We're East in the Coast same with- city now, Jen, even though we never see each other. <laughs> I know. It's so funny. It's so funny. Yeah. No, it's it's crazy. No, we definitely need to get coffee sometime when our schedules aren't like crazy. Or or we can we want to get out of the house, right? Right. <laughs> but but yeah, you know, it's just I started podcasting because also another thing I wanted to add is like like we're we're always paranoid to drive our car because it's so old, like we bought it off of someone and long and behold, it like broke down twice so just the last time we started driving it. So for me, I'm just thinking, okay, I have to do everything from home. And it's like since we've moved here, it's been difficult for me to go out and have a social life because they're kind of like excuses, but not excuses. Like usually Scott's (laughs) the one, Scott's the dog and pony show, right? So he's the one that (laughs) is going out there to the events and traveling. And I'm usually the one that's staying at home. I don't have kids, but I have a dog with separation anxiety. (laughs) And it's only now that we um, finally are signing him up for daycare locally. He used to always go to daycare, but because we just moved here in Virginia Beach, like we had to go through this whole like vaccination thing all over again. And that takes a while. So we're finally doing that. And I'm telling Scott next year, I am getting out of the house. <laughs> I'm going to like <laughs> build a social life. I'm going to go to all the networking events. I mean, that that's like practical. And 2020, gonna... the year of gin yeah. in person. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, it's funny. Appar- apparently, when Scott goes out networking, people are always asking, where's Jen? Like, did you leave Jen at home again? Like, it's like this ongoing joke now. And it's like, it's not like I'm captive here. It's just that <laughs> I run operations in our business, too. So it's not like I can just go out there and like bring my laptop and work right. like while I'm at a networking event. It'd be really rude and a waste of time anyway. But anyway, next year, all about it. Like, I'm all about getting out there and socializing and stuff. But until then, podcasting was my way to have a social life life to connect with people and to have these real authentic conversations in theme of what you're saying.
saying, I think that's what it's all about is, you know, we have to find our own way of building, of building connection and community. And especially if you are marketing something, I think that's the way to do it is by being authentic and telling your story because it's more unique and it's so needed. It's so much more needed than you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. It is. And and you might not think that a certain aspect of your life is worth sharing. So one of the big things that I, I tend to run into with my clients is they don't know how to share some of their most vulnerable times, how it developing into their biggest strengths. Mm-hmm. So one of my clients had been a victim of domestic abuse in a former marriage. One of my clients has been a really an overachiever and in, in getting involved in multiple projects and really coming into her own and finding like this one thing. And one of them was really interested in how can I develop more things that bring people to me versus me having to have like 500 on the book appointments to go see all of these people. So Mm -hmm. all three of those stories are different, but it all comes down to like their personalities and why they are the way that they are. If the latter's, you know, close ratio, if 80% of her business comes from when she meets with people in person her funnel system needs to look like that. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Her stories need to be built around in-person conversations. Her stories need to be built around planning events that bring people to her. They do not need to be book your consultation call for this product widget now, you know? Mm -hmm. So the stories that people can tell should support their business goals. It should give them a little inside look at what's going on in their life. And For these people, when I came into the military spouse community, I happened to find a group called Millspo Project. I had gotten referred there by somebody who was a former agency client Mm -hmm. of mine, Lindsay Germono, happened to tell me about Millspo Project because she was, I believe, at the time on their board of directors. And she Mm -hmm. said, you know, you're a new military spouse. You've been in business. Like, I think that this is something that you should look at. And so I went and met for coffee with a group of six or seven military spouse, women in business. And Mm -hmm. the conversation was so impactful and different than any conversation I had had at that point about military spouse life, because it wasn't about their spouses. (laughs) Mm. It was about what were their dreams? What were their goals? And how were they going to hold each other accountable as a group? And Beautiful. so that's really when I got involved in Millspo Project at first as a member. Uh, Millspo Project has changed quite a bit over the last several years. It's really moved towards more of an event organization now where we put on live events. But I wanted to kind of recreate that experience. While the chapter system doesn't exist anymore, I put on something called Millspo Live and Millspo Gather. Mm-hmm. And we bring in military spouses in business to talk about the realities of being a military spouse in business, whether they're the frontline leader of a brand, whether they run their own business, whether they want to do multiple businesses. But what I want to tell people is, you know, find your communities. They're not going to come to you. Very rarely do they come to you. You have to really clearly say, what do I need? What do I want to spend time doing? And go out and find that. And test drive those boats, girl. (laughs) (laughs) There you go. Not every boat is the fit. And don't assume all boats are the same. So for me, I knew very early on that Millspo Project was the group I wanted to embed in. It was not corporately sponsored. It was not government funded. It was a group of women who wanted to make a difference sitting around a table and talking about their biz dreams. Like that's what it was about. There wasn't anything else about it. And that's what I liked about it. Again, the no BS thing that was coming yeah, on. Yeah, I so love it. that's what I really enjoyed. And that was my dip into military spouse life. And from that group, from watching all of these people who had struggled with businesses, struggled with marketing, had success in businesses, I realized I could start a business too. I always mm. thought I would be the person who helped a brand succeed who was, again, like an operations person or the strategist behind the scenes, I never thought that that would be my own company. I never thought that that would be me doing those things. So now I get the best of both worlds. I took something called the Harrison assessment, which tells you a little bit about your work DNA and what would be good fits for you. And my Harrison assessment said, I enjoy short-term projects. (laughs) Okay. I enjoy um, collaborating on a team. With equal play, meaning the parties are equal that are in the collaboration. Mm -hmm. There's no leader. There's no follower. There is Mm -hmm. equal distribution there. And it also said that I love to teach and train. 
So that in combination, I said, I can create a business out of this. And so that's what I do to kind of support my writing and artistry habit. <laughs> I, have a, I have a business that, you know, kind of came to fruition because of the women I sat around the table with that's and realized so that I was giving advice to these people about marketing and content. And wow, I could create a business out of this because people started to ask me, can I pay you to give me what you're giving me for free once a month? Can I just start paying you for that? And that's when I realized like, oh, I have a business niche here. It's not a social media marketer. It's kind of all of those things. And it's really Mm -hmm. about getting straight on what your stories are, what makes you you, what makes you stand out before you start putting money and eggs in all these other baskets. Who are you? And that's Mm -hmm. where people really struggle. Who am I? What am I now that I have this life? What is my identity? And that's what I help people kind of hone in on and is it hone or home? <laughs> I think it's with right. an N, hone. I know, I know, hone. <laughs> um, this, the writer in me is like, can I grammar check that? Uh, but um, <laughs> uh, that's what we help people hone in on. And so whether it's for a business or whether it's in my personal life, like that's how I like to spend my time. My idea of a good time is hanging out in a very small group of women and talking about what badass stuff we're going to accomplish and strategize about it. Like, that's my idea of a great time. My second idea of a great time is hiking in the woods alone. You know, oh, that's okay. about it. <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid to hike alone. So good for you. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, oh, I think like, before you can share a story, you have to know the perspective of the author. And you have to know what their voice is going to be. And so I encourage people, audience members listening, those military spouses listening, Nobody knows what your life is like. And if you feel lonely, if you feel separated, if you want to create more opportunities for yourself, start talking about the things that are important to you. Start Mm. talking about the communities you want to be a part of and discover, and people will refer you those directions. But if you're Mm -hmm. not talking about it, people don't know that you need that in your life. So I think a lot of people frame it in terms of like a complaint Whereas if they frame it as this is what I'm going through, this is my request, does anybody have any recommendations? I feel like their world opens up a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the stories that we share, I think people are wasting some breath on things that don't get them to the next part of their life. They don't Mm -hmm. get them to that next impact opportunity. They don't get them to that next stage of their business. And I want people to understand that time is limited. I got a very, you know, you understand this as a gold star daughter. I understand this as somebody who lost a parent last year, much later in Mm -hmm. life. Time is limited. You don't know when your time is up. And if Mm -hmm. you care about creating a legacy, what you post on social matters, how you spend your breath matters, how you spend your time matters. And if you can share the stories that support where you want to go, versus sharing the stories that don't provide any value to your life, you will get a lot farther. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And you will have a more purposeful life for sure. Absolutely. Nikki, I feel like you just gave an amazing motivational talk. So thank you for that. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. Love it. I do have a question. This whole conversation has been about telling your vulnerable story about yourself, like opening up. For people who don't know the first steps to do that? Like, what would you tell them to start opening up? Like, what would that look like? So I did a lot of work with someone named Mary Beth Highland, who runs a business called Spark Vision out of Baltimore, Maryland. I invested in a coach. Not everybody has to do this, but you could certainly find some of her content online for free. But I did a lot of values work. So values is where I started. Mm -hmm. She says that values is like your internal compass. And if you can align with your value system, every day is kind of more filled with purpose. I absolutely believe this. I started to do this work in combination with a military spouse's work named Ashley Mateka. She does a program called Wellevance, which is kind of the eight dimensions of wellness. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, to start sharing your story, you have to get really clear on what matters to you. You Mm -hmm. have to cut through the BS. What doesn't matter to me? Who do I not want to talk to? Who do I not want to be in this audience, right? Because every story will attract and repel. If you start posting tons of things about your children on your feed, you're going to eliminate the people who don't want to hear anything about your children or who are having trouble conceiving or 
who just don't want any part that like, that doesn't resonate with them. Right. So you have mm-hmm, to know, right. like when you can build it off of values and you can say, these are the things that are really important to me. And you can say, I'll use the example of like, for me, it's openness is a huge one. And learning is a huge one. Mm-hmm. I don't like to waste time. My husband, we always use this example. My husband enjoys Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> I can't believe I've got this. Yeah, he enjoys, DOD. There's a Middle Earth poster <laughs> yeah, in this office that I'm in at the moment. My husband, <laughs> his it. idea of the good time is he's going to read a book that is fantasy. He mm. is going to play a game that is strategy and fantasy that has no outcome on his life. How I will spend that exact same two hours is with a workbook, is with a journal, is mm-hmm. meditation in the woods. Um, so it starts with the values that are important to you, as well as the shared values of those people around you. So if you can start to share your story from the perspective of understanding what matters to you, if domestic violence matter to you, you could really start to share stories around the organizations in your area that support support help with that versus mm-hmm. this is uh, my charity give back program to dogs on deployment if you don't have anything to do with dogs or a military family, right? So start mm-hmm. to think about the things that are impacting your life currently that have impacted your life in the past and how those shaped the values that you now carry throughout your life. And I really have to credit Mary Beth with Spark Vision for kind of bringing that to light for me because I didn't know how to articulate that. I did Mm -hmm. not know how to say these were the things that were most important to me, not just saying family, financial security, you know, like how do you activate the behaviors that make those values come to life? How do you consistently show that? And through storytelling, you can start to see how those things aligned in your life and got you to the next step. Mm -hmm. So I'd say start there, start with who you are, start with your values, who's influenced you, who's influenced you for the better as well as, you know, had some things that my mom passed away last year. I always say, I always credit my mom for my drive because my mom didn't have drive. My mom Mm. was consent to sit on the back porch with her cigarette and her romance novel, petting her dog. And literally that's how I saw her spend the last 20 years of her life. And to me, like, that would have been torture. Like I Mm -hmm. could not have been okay living that life, but it shows you that everybody's value system is different. That's what she valued. She valued quality time, alone time, you know, comfort of what she sought out as comfort. Right. Um, So I would tell people like when sharing your story, start with the values, start with those things that matter to you and that can help shape where you want to go. It cuts Mm -hmm. so much drama from your life. You'd be so surprised. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Because I do not value crowds like military. I went to two conferences this year and I swear I almost died at the end of both of them. (laughs) I went to military (laughs) influencer conference. (laughs) Amazing (gasps) conference. I couldn't do anything after 4 p.m. I literally had to go home, put meditation on and just lay there because I was so exhausted from the amount of people. And the second conference I went to was Rise Business with Rachel Hollis. And it was three days, 8 to 5 p.m. in stadium seating. Oh my and goodness. I was literally like just as valuable as the information was. And I my wheels are still spinning post-Rise conference. I didn't need a sedative at the end of that. I could not move or talk to anybody at the end oh of every goodness. single day. So what I realized is I really value a virtual experience. I can manage my energy because people are so concerned about being on in person. I really have to have scheduled time to be on. I cannot, I can't, you you said that Scott does the dog and pony. I cannot dog and pony. There will be a calendar date and a calendar time. (laughs) And before that date and time, I will have slept, napped, taken ibuprofen, had a sits bath, meditated, (laughs) like all of these things that happened ahead of that event. So I I just say, like, know what's really important to you and be okay owning that this is what's important to you. And it's okay if it's not important to somebody else. You will attract the people that you want to attract when you can be more vulnerable and authentic about who you are and what matters to you and what value you can provide the world. 
Nikki, you are speaking my language. I went to three conferences, a military influencer conference being one of them. And I feel like if there's anything I realized, because I haven't gone to conferences like probably since <laughs> last year. Like I just... <laughs> Some people I'm live for a girl. I, I know, <laughs> I know. Like I'm like a true introvert by nature. Just like you, I like to have scheduled stuff. That's why I like podcasting because I could schedule my social mm-hmm. hour. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> but no, I totally agree with you. I was just thinking the other day, I was like, you know, most of these conferences offer virtual tickets now. Mm-hmm. And I think I just need to do those. Like, I feel like I'll get more value. I mean, unless I know that I really want to see someone in person, like I want to meet people for the first time, like that would make a lot of sense. But if right. I'm really just there for the content and the learning, I think a virtual ticket would probably be better for me moving forward. But yeah, after those, I was telling Scott, I was like, after those three conferences, <laughs> and I was telling all my friends too, I was like, if you don't hear from me for the rest of the year, it's because <laughs> I've, I'm done. Like I'm done. <laughs> socializing. I'm done putting on a show. I'm not that I mean to put on a show, but like you said, it's like you have to be on and you have to be alert. And I mean, you're going to be at a conference. You have to connect with people. I can't hide from that. You know, (laughs) like that's the reason why you're there. I remember the intro conversation to MIC was they had a network, you know, like intro for newcomers kind of thing. And the guy got up on stage and said, if you're not there, you're going to miss opportunities, right? If you don't Mm -hmm. go to this event, you're going to miss opportunities. If you don't go to this group, Mm -hmm. you're going to miss opportunities. And I think while I believe that is an accurate statement, there's no guarantee that an opportunity will be there for you. And you might make a deeper connection if you bow out of one of those things you're telling everybody they need to be at and Mm -hmm. really bring your A game to the next one versus bringing 10% to everything the rest of the day. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think that's that's the way I look at it. (laughs) Yeah. And I think that's what it is about live conferences is they really push a lot of FOMO, you know, like to Mm -hmm. to show up to everything. Like you got to be here. You got to be there. You're going to miss out. Like there's going to be that one message that you're going to miss out on that could change the course of your life, the course of your business, you know, and I'm just like, you know, I don't really operate in fear in that kind of way or like sense (laughs) of urgency. Like I know that things eventually go on sale. Like, you know, Black Friday having at the time of this recording having just happened. It's like, it's funny because it's Tuesday now and I, I just got emailed of like Cyber Monday has been extended, you know? (laughs) And so it's like, you're never really going to miss out on the things that you're meant to have in your life. I don't think you're going to miss out on it. And I think that's what the conferences taught me. It was like, you know, I could pace myself. Like I used to dress up really nicely for conferences (laughs) in the past, but this time I was like, nope, I'm wearing tights. (laughs) I'm wearing a loose top. I'm wearing flats. Like all good. And well, I, it's I funny because I wore like be clearly demonstrate like it doesn't like he <laughs> yeah. stood out because of what he wore. But yeah. that was his comfort, you know, and I think for women and men, it's really different. Like some mm. it just I don't know what it is, like what's ingrained in us and what we're trained like there wasn't a single person, a single woman there without makeup. There wasn't a single woman there who didn't think about what she was putting on before she walked mm. out the door. But right. every guy out there was probably like, yeah, this works. I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, like, they packed a bag yeah. of three things and they just walked out because they really embrace who they are a little bit more. And so like for women in particular, like let's be okay talking about this is who we are today and this is how yeah. we got here. And and this is what we look like without makeup. And, you know, it's what we look like with bun hair because yeah. you didn't have time to shower before you jumped on the podcast. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. No, totally. Trust me. Like I probably like wash my hair maybe once a week. I mean, cause it's just like, well, I don't go out of the house. I, my hair is always tied up in a bun. Like, so what? Like it just, no one comes close enough to smell me anyway, other than Scott. And he probably hasn't showered either. So it's just, well, here we are. Too smelly. <laughs> People working from home. <laughs> no, I, you know, I feel like Nikki, uh, the conversation of like, the way that women like feel compelled to carrying themselves in public. I think that's definitely a conversation for another time. I feel like we absolutely can, we can go have a long conversation about that. Cause I know it, there's so much to say about it, but I think the short message here is to challenge yourself to be your most authentic self and to add upon what you were saying earlier, you know, starting with what matters to you. If you don't know what matters to you, and I've done this in the past, like if I don't know what matters to me, I start off with what doesn't matter to me. I start off with what what I don't want in my life. And then I see what the opposite of that is. I remember like, so I've been self-employed for almost a decade now. 2020 will be my 10 year anniversary. And in my young 20s, 
I remember like I got fired from four jobs in my young 20s. So it was like a clear sign that I just was not meant for a job. <laughs> I remember writing down like, cause I felt so, you know, rejected and defected and just like, just this broken person. I thought like, what am I good at? You know, what am I meant for? And I remember making a list of what I didn't like. I was like, well, I don't like working in an office. I don't like being around people all the time. You know, I don't like this. I don't like that. And then right. long and behold, that led me to being self-employed, to working from home, to, you know, having podcast shows where I can schedule the times I socialize with people. So afterward, I can just relax and, you know, re-energize, right? And I think it's just allowing yourself to explore that and how eventually that will translate, especially if you're going to be a business owner, you are a business owner, that will translate into your messaging. But just like what you said, you know, if we're going to work on your marketing message, it starts with understanding the author and their character and what they feel like matters the most to them. So so beautifully said, like everything that you just said. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I always yeah. say just do less of what drains you, more of what fills you. And if you yes. can do that, and if you do that in your life, that will come out through the stories that you share. Because mm-hmm. when you're doing more of what fills you up, your stories will be more positive. Your mm-hmm. engagements will be more positive. Your relationships will be deeper. If you're doing a lot of something that just does not resonate with you right now, you're going to have more negativity in your life. You're going to have more friction in your relationships. You're going to be more tired. So I just, again, I've invested in some coaches that have helped me kind of reframe my mind in those senses because I came from a place of like, oh, woe is me and Mm -hmm. have really turned it around to how is this for me? How is what I'm going Mm -hmm. through right now part of a bigger story and actually getting me to the next step? Right, right. Well, Nikki, I feel like we had such a wonderful conversation today, just learning about you and what you do and the importance of storytelling, telling your most authentic, vulnerable, open story about yourself and translating that into your marketing message and just everything. I just, I love our conversation today. Also for our listeners, I have also enjoyed the conversation and want to get a hold of you. How can they do that? So my platform of choice where anybody can connect with me and follow me is going to be on LinkedIn. So LinkedIn slash in slash Nikki James Zellner. That's where you can find me to kind of get my musings in the business sense. If they want to actually have more of like a personalized experience, they can visit my website where content connects.com. There's a newsletter they can sign up for and I drop into their inbox like once a week. And I tell tactical, inspirational stories of how to share your story. This is for personal brands as well as people who are possibly thinking about getting in business or currently in business. It's really just talking to women and talking about how to share our stories more deeply and more authentically. Awesome. Beautiful. And listeners, if you didn't catch that, don't worry. I always include those in the show notes. So you're welcome. I'm always really (laughs) generous with the show notes on the show. (laughs) With that said, Nikki, I want to thank you again so much for your time and also to our listeners as well. We hope that you have gained new knowledge, education, or resources to help you continue to hold down the fort. So I'm Jen Amos. Thank you, Nikki, so much for your time and to our listeners. And we look forward to seeing you or speaking with you in the next episode. Tune in next time. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Bye, everybody.